Welcome to Introduction to 3D Printing, Joe Cerrone, Alan Rosen. Today we're going to take a look at Chapter 2, 3D Printers and Printing Materials. In the last 10 years or so, 3D printers have gone from being large pieces of industrial equipment to being able to fit on your desktop. On the desktop here we have one of our Dremel 3D45s. When we bought our first 3D printer, it was about $30,000 from Stratus Dimension. As we take a look at our desktop 3D printers, the most common type of 3D printers work with spools of plastic called filament, which it melts and lays down to create object layers. And so here's our filament right here. This is our 3D printer. And they're evolving constantly as are the materials. Filament printers are printers that work on plastic filament or this plastic product that is, it's like a coil, almost like on a fishing rod. This would be a Cartesian X, Y, and Z 3D printer. And the technology is called FDM, Fused Deposit Modeling. Really heard it called FFF that much, but people will often call it FDM printing. And these are your low cost introductory printers that we're gonna be using to get started with this course. When we talk about Cartesian printers, what we're talking about is the coordinate system. On a Cartesian coordinate system, you have an x-axis, a y-axis, and a z-axis. And those are how these printers are referred to. Delta printers, we have one of these. One of the fellows in the engineering lab uh, purchased it. They will allow you to build a very large print volume. And so you can print some very large objects rather quickly with them. I'm not a huge fan of them. You can get them on Amazon from CNC, see me CNC. And they are fused deposit modeling printers or FDM. You can see the coils of filament right here. It goes up into the machine through the extruder, through these Bowden tubes, and then is extruded to create the different geometry layer by layer. And so it would start off on the bottom layer right here on the build plate, and then it creates it with additive manufacturing, building each layer like the slice of an MRI till the product is completed. There are a number of parts involved in 3D printing and essentially, a lot of times people will call it, it's sort of like a uh, hot glue gun, you know, as, a, as an analogy. It extrudes the plastic through this hot nozzle one layer at a time. But what controls the nozzle placement is the stepper motors. And so we have these precise controls for the x-axis in a Cartesian coordinate system. Here's our z-axis. And those are controlled by what's called G-codes, which are generated by the slicing software. They provide the tool path for the extruder to deposit the plastic material layer by layer. And so stepper motors are a low cost motor option compared to things like servo motors, which we're using in robotics, which are highly precise. And they're good enough to give us the type of resolution that we need to 3D print. When we look at some of the 3D printers and some of the terminology behind it and the control for the Dremels that we're using, we'll use a touch screen. And so you can operate them without a, any other, anything else. It's basically a standalone unit. You can turn it on and you can put your pallet or build plate into the machine, load the filament into the extruder, 
and then you can put your USB into the machine, read your STL file, actually it's the G code file that's created by the slicer, read your G code file, and build the part. And it's controlled through this touch screen. The build platforms come out of the printers. And so you can swap them out. If you have a print farm with, say, six or seven 3D printers, you can then use all of them and then swap out the plates or the pallets, the platforms, for different projects. We have the extruder. The extruder is located right here. It has a nozzle and the plastic will be fed up into the extruder and then it, it feeds down into the extruder based on the G-code feed and speed rates that are set by the slicer. Different materials will have different feed and speed rates to perform optimum filament extrusion. There's a gear that will grab the filament and bring it into the nozzle through a Bowden tube. Bowden tube is just a piece of plastic. It's a straw, essentially. Other ways you can print SD cards, you can print wirelessly over the internet, um, over the network. So these are Wi-Fi enabled, and so we can also um, build our 3D prints via Wi-Fi, or uh, the Dremel actually has a cloud-based software in which we can work. We're not working with that at this time, but as the technology develops, I think that will become quite standard. So as we print, we print layer by layer, doesn't always work. And so occasionally you'll have some, some difficulty with build plate adhesion, or you'll have a model that is not supported. And this is an example of what a problem would look like where you'll get this bird's nest of plastic filament. That's why a lot of your 3D printers are enabled with webcams, so you can verify and watch how those prints are created. Work with 3D printers, you can have an overhang of about 45 degrees and still be able to print with that. Bridging is what is what is called when you have printing over a gap. This is what is called support material, and that would be removed. And depending on the type of support material, the dual extrusion nozzles will have one material set for the FDM for the printing or for the material. And then the other extruder is set for a support material, which is then removable, which is much better than chipping away at all of the support material. But it does cost and it does take time. And so the low end printers will often not have dual extrusion. <clears throat> but in the future, you'll see most of your printers will have more. So essentially, I, I, I'll do these activities. We've been doing these throughout the class. Uh, I like to print calibration cubes to make sure that the printers are accurate. And so we'll go on to the Thingiverse, download a 3D cube, learn how to use a caliper to measure that, and we'll print it, and then we'll measure it with a caliper. And so then we can check to see how accurate our 3D printer works. This is just an example of what the slicer looks like. So as we work with 3D printing, we create the geometry with a CAD model. 
And once we have that CAD model created, we bring it into the slicer. And then the slicer will allow us to go through and put them on the build plate. They'll allow us to orientate that so that <clears throat> we don't necessarily need build plate support. And to be able to get that all configured to be the best optimal print. Sometimes we'll do another activity where we'll download something like this, this toy ball that will 3D print. Bring it into the slicer. Show how we can bring that in, how we would orientate that on the build plate. And depending on how the geometry, since this doesn't have any large overhangs, it can be printed without support material. And you kind of find out as you print things. The first time you print it, you don't necessarily know what you're going to get. And so there is some experimentation with these models as we develop them for the best method of additive manufacturing. We're still using the USB method, and so we can print with PLA, polylactic acid. Typically, we'll go with 3 millimeters, 0.3 millimeters, low quality. Higher the quality, the smoother, the finer the layers are. Then I'll put different build plate adhesions on so that <clears throat> the part doesn't come off. I have a brim on this one that will hold it on just enough to allow it to print. Recommend that you get a set of calipers, digital calipers, so that you can check measurements and take measurements. You can buy your filament in two different sizes. You can buy it in this 2.85 millimeter or 1.75 millimeter filament. We typically use the 1.75 millimeter filament. Larger printers will use the larger diameter printer diameter. On Amazon, if you were to purchase PLA, which is a biodegradable, low-cost printing material, it's about $30 per coil, and you can get it in a day. The problem with it is it has a relatively low temperature, and so you have to be a little bit careful about putting this type of material for anything that you're going to design to be put outside. Most processing is the things that you do to the 3D print after you have created it. And oftentimes it's removing the build plate material or the support material. It takes time. It's kind of therapeutic, but at the, you know, but after you've done it for a while, that's why people will go into these dual extruders with soluble filaments and they'll get a part tank where they don't have to go through and do as much post processing. But post-processing is just a small thing that we're touching on. Right now, we're just 3D printing, but there's all kinds of things when you get into the manufacturing processes as far as to how you would take that completed 3D part and then prepare it for presentation quality prototypes or for parts that you would actually use for production. All projects like these refrigerator magnets, And just as a recap, we talked about this in our Zoom meeting. Make sure that you go through and answer the questions from the end of Chapter 2. And you work on completing lab number 3. Thank you very much. Enjoy your time with class.